You know, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, a true story. It happened in, I think, 1986. Um, it happened in the Himalayan mountains. There's a very special mountain in the Himalayas. Anybody know the name of that mountain? Everest. Very good. You know, um, actually, I've gone to India a few different times on the north uh, west side of India, and I have seen the Himalayas. And it's interesting, you can see them from miles and miles and miles away. But the tops are just covered with clouds. It's incredible. But something happened in the year 1986. There was a group of, a, um, group of mountain climbers who decided to, you know, go after Mount Everest. And what's interesting about Mount Everest is the top of Mount Everest is the most dangerous part of it. They call it the death zone. Why do you think they call it the death zone? should be pretty obvious. Because people die up there. They're like, death zone? I get it now. Okay, so they call it the death zone for a reason. And it's incredible because most people don't die in the ascent. They die in the descent. Once they reach the, the top and they take pictures and they make, begin to make their way down, oftentimes storms will just come on very quickly. I mean, just in a matter of minutes. And people will be trapped on that mountain, run out of oxygen. Um, the many descriptions of people who've climbed Mount Everest is when they start getting up to the top, you start seeing very lethargic, and they almost walk zombie-like as they're trying to make it to the top. And uh, when they finally reach the top, they're really excited, and then they begin to make the dangerous descent down. In fact, what's interesting, there are still over 200 bodies on top of Mount Everest. 200 bodies. There have been the most unusual kinds of experiences that have taken place on Mount Everest. Um, when you climb Mount Everest, what's interesting is you need to have um, a certain quantity of oxygen. You need enough oxygen. And when people begin to make their way up to the top, the oxygen amount is calculated in the tanks. I mean, they have to have a certain amount of oxygen. They have to carry that weight. Everything is calculated. Now, what is very interesting is um, when they begin to make it to the top, they have to check their oxygen tanks constantly to make sure they have enough oxygen because the air is very thin up there. There was one incident that happened several years ago about a group of mountain climbers who got to the top near the death zone, and there they found a man who was still alive from a previous expedition, and he was just there. His tanks had run out of oxygen, and he was just left there to die. They radio down to base camp, uh, base camp, and they ask, um, you know, base camp, what should we do right now? There's a man that's here, and uh, we don't know if we have enough oxygen. If we try to carry him down, most likely we're not going to be able to make it down. If we give him any of our oxygen tanks, we're not going to have enough oxygen tanks. What would you do in that situation? The unusual thing is, I shouldn't say unusual, which is probably what most people might do, is they left him there. They got to the top, came back down, dead. And the whole thing was on video. Very incredible, the stories of life and death, the struggles on top of Mount Everest. 1986, there was an unusual expedition to go up there. And people went up there, and uh, over 13 to 14 people lost their lives in that horrible expedition. But there was one man who survived that expedition. In fact, what was so incredible about this individual is that he did not carry oxygen tanks with him. He had so trained his lungs in high altitude that he was able to make it to the top without an oxygen tank and make it down without an oxygen tank. Many of the journalists interviewed him afterwards after that tragedy with all those people who died, and they said, why did you go up to that mountain? Didn't you know death was waiting for you on top of that mountain? Didn't you think you were going to die on top of that mountain? He responded, I didn't go up there to die. I went up there to live. Friends, I want you to understand something. When God brings us to mountaintop experiences, it's because he wants us to live. Amen? And when we go down into the valley, he still wants us to live. Our experience needs to be one of continual progressive growth. New challenges, and by the way, new challenges means new forms of growth. You have one Christian life, and God wants to use that for his glory. Amen? The name of the sermon today is called sodium chloride. Anybody know what sodium chloride is? Salt, how'd you guess, right? Sodium chloride, right? 
we're going to be looking at salt in the Bible. Everybody take your Bible. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. You know, people always ask the question, wait a minute, when you study out the four Gospels, why is it that the accounts are not 100% accurate? And I want you to understand why. And when I mean accurate, I mean in the sense of why aren't they matching the other accounts very specifically in detail? Now I want you to think about that. If you had four different Gospels that were exactly the same in every detail, wouldn't you begin to question the validity of the Gospels? I mean, just think about it. If both, you know, someone like Matthew said, yeah, when Jesus spoke to Peter, James, and John on top of the mountain, we were really scared when the voice came from heaven. You want to know why that would be very difficult? Because Matthew wasn't on top of the mountain, right? The point I'm trying to make is the reason why there are distinctions in the four Gospels and differences is because God is trying to show us various angles of the life of Christ. And if all four Gospels were exactly alike in every single detail, that would be, to me, extremely suspect extremely suspect. So that's why when you're studying out the four Gospels, you're able to see the most beautiful angles of Jesus' ministry, brought through the individuality of someone who was a tax collector, someone who was a friend of Peter, someone who was a fisherman, and someone who was a doctor. And through these various angles, God is giving us a beautiful spread of the life of Christ. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Now, it's very interesting. Matthew chapter 5 is about the Sermon on the Mount. An unusual part about this whole story is this, is that there are very few sermons recorded from Christ in the Gospels. Very few sermons. But do you know what's actually recorded in the Gospels? The actions of Christ. The actions of Christ. The life of Christ seen in movement is actually recorded more because God wants us to understand it wasn't just his words that preached, it was his lifestyle. Amen? So we're going to one of the sermons that Jesus preached, if not the most important one, Matthew chapter 5. You're there, go and say amen. Amen. Now let's start with verse 1. And seeing the what? Multitudes. Very good. He went up on a mountain and he was seated with his disciples. By the way, where was he located? Mountain. Jesus, do you know what he did? He was a mountain climber. Jesus was a mountain climber. You read the accounts. He's constantly climbing the mountains. It was part of his recreation. Jesus was not a lazy person. Amen? Even these details are extremely important. Let's continue on. Seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated with his disciples, came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain. Very good. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see who? Excellent. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? Sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. By the way, you know what's so unusual about this phrase, blessed are you? Jesus actually used it in other circumstances. He would say to uh, Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjonas, right? So you see this phrase come up over and over again. Jesus is saying, blessed are you. Blessed are you. You are extremely blessed. In fact, the word sometimes translated, happy are you. Now, when we study this out, it's kind of unusual the way Jesus is starting this out. He's saying, hey, in the sermon, Blessed are you. Blessed are you in this circumstance. Blessed are you in this circumstance. Every one of these circumstances, friends, are not positive circumstances, at least from worldly perspective, right? He said, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. By the way, if you have a chance to study out Desire of Ages on this very chapter, she says that when Jesus was actually saying the word blessed are you, he was actually using a familiar salutation that is used in heaven. Essentially, when he was saying the Sermon on the Mount, do you know what he was giving? Heaven's welcome. Blessed are you. Blessed are you, Tom. Blessed are you, Tyra. Blessed are you, Doreen. 
This is incredible. The way Jesus is actually starting out the Sermon on the Mount is with heaven's welcome. Now let's continue on with this. Notice what happens next. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and, pers- revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven and for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the sodium chloride of the earth. You are the what? It says salt. It doesn't say sodium chloride. You are the, I don't know what version you have. (laughs) You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its what? Flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now notice verse 14. You are the what? Light of the world, a city that is on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp, but put it under a basket, but on a what? Lamp stand, and it gives light to those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works and glorify your Father where? Jesus says something very interesting during this instruction. He says these unusual words. He said, you are the what? Salt of the earth. And then he continues on. He says, and you are the light of the what? World. You know what's amazing about this? This is actually an emphasis on the pronoun. In other words, he was saying, you, you only are the salt of the earth. You only are the light of the world. Now, what's the implication? Salt had a very interesting purpose. Salt was used for preservation to prevent organisms from dying, right? Like, for example, or degenerating. They used it because of no, no refrigeration. They used it to preserve fish or meat. Salt prevented degeneration. The purpose of light was so that you could see in darkness. So what's the implication? The implication is this. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the world, and when he said, you are the light of the world, what he was actually saying was, the world is degenerating. The world is in darkness. And if you stop being salt or you stop being light, then it's finished. Friends, the implication about the condition of the world is here. Jesus says something about believers, something that was very common in the household of almost every Israelite. They had salt and they had a lamp. You would find that in almost every single Israelite household. You would find salt that was used to preserve food, and then you would find a candle because when it came dark, you would need a light. So Jesus was telling something that was very familiar to every single Israelite. He says to them, you are the salt of of the world and you are the light of the world now we know salt has various purposes you probably heard a million sermons on being the salt of the world but i want you to understand something right here the difference between salt and light is that salt infuses the food in other words it's more internal and light is something that is more external when jesus says you are the salt of the world you are to Spread within your environment. Permeate into your environment. Disappear into your environment. When he says to you, you are the light of the world, you are to shine that light where you are planted. One is internal and one is external. One is not seen or supposed to be not seen and one is designed to be seen. So what is Jesus telling the believer? He's telling the believer two things. Number one, you need to not be seen, and you need to be seen. Now, if you're from the land of India, that makes perfect sense. We're called the land of contradictions for a reason, right? But Jesus says you are the salt of the world. Now, you know what salt is, right? Salt is used for a multitude of things. It's used to preserve food, right? Have you ever tasted food that did not have salt in it? Oh, the most of you guys have perfect food, right? Every time you eat it, right? I mean, many of us have tasted food that required some salt. I have a good friend. Whenever they cook food, they always cook food very, very bland. Okay? Very bland. Like, there is no salt. There is no pepper in there. And when I tell them, I say, could you add some salt or pepper? You know what they do? 
they overload the salt and the pepper. And then it's a weird taste in your mouth that pretty much ruins the rest of anything else you eat. Anybody ever had that experience before, right? So there's some good to salt. There's some negativity to salt. What Jesus was saying about the life of the Christian when he was saying you are salt, he was saying to them, you are to infuse into this world. You have a special God-given influence, and you are to use that influence to lead other people to the gospel. Can you say amen to that? But salt is not something that should be seen externally. In fact, whenever I see food that has salt on it, it's very interesting. If you can see the salt, many times it's not a good thing. Salt is supposed to disappear into the food. It's to be stirred throughout the food, right? And so what God is teaching here is that you are to be salt to the earth, to the earth. Excuse me, I tried to say world and earth is the same word. Worth, right? You are to be salt. Now, Jesus said some amazing things in his life towards peop to people. He healed them. He blessed them. He ministered to them. Jesus, the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, the word became flesh and what? Dwelt among them. God calls every single believer, wherever their environment is, to be salt. And whatever the intercourse of your life is, you are to be a flavor, a preserving agent that prevents other people from destruction. Remember what I said to you in the seminar? I said, the Bible teaches the wages of sin is what? More than just that God gives sin its death penalty, but sin by itself has its own death penalty. In other words, sin is the principle that brings death. God doesn't actually have to give sin its death penalty. In fact, God calls that which has a death penalty sin. And that's an important understanding of why God hates sin so much is because it ultimately destroys you. And so the Bible is teaching you are to prevent destruction in other people's life. Salt is designed to prevent. When you put food or say, for example, in the Israelite culture, whenever they pack some fish, they would completely cover it with salt to prevent the fish from decomposing. And then it was no good. Our world, because it is a sinful world, is constantly heading in the direction of death, self-destruction. And when Jesus says you are the salt of the world, what he is saying is you are to be a life-giving agent that prevents destruction in other people's life. Friends, I want you to understand something. If Jesus did not pour salt upon the world since the fall of Adam and Eve, we would never have gotten to this place. We would have been destroyed a lot, time, lot long ago. But because of God's blessings... He wants the world to be blessed. And so each one of us is called to be salt. Now, what's it mean to be salt? It means that you are to be a blessing in every single environment and situation that you find yourself in. You'd be surprised. Every single day, God is crossing people through your path. And he wants you to be a blessing. And in that moment of that opportunity, you have a, a time to be a blessing, someone to be encouraging. You know, I have this friend. She is like my Christian mom. Every time I call her, I mean, she's always just positive. And I'm not just going to be like that kind of fake positivity, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, she is generally just uh, uh, legitimately a very encouraging person. And it's amazing because when I call her, many times I may be down or I may be discouraged, and she gives me courage every time I call her. And she listens to me. And it's amazing because when I come into her presence, I'm just, every time I leave it, I'm blessed. I'm just blessed. You know, I was reading the story of Dwight L. Moody. Very interesting. President Woodrow Wilson was actually somebody who recorded this account. He sat down in a barber shop, and he began to get his hair cut, he noticed a strange person come in, and he said, I just felt them. They came in, they sat down right next to him, and they were getting a haircut. And then he began to notice that individual. And he said, what I noticed about that individual is he really cared about the barber who was cutting his hair. And then he said, the man, he was, he was being a blessing to him. And he said, I noticed that. At the very end, 
He introduced himself to that individual, and it was Dwight L. Moody, the powerful preacher. And he says, what I realize is that man had influence. Ellen White says that we are called to cultivate social power. Each one of us, is desi- is God is calling us to use our social gifts to bless many people. Now, you may think to yourself, you are not a social person. Anybody feel they're not a social person? Tyrell, I believe you're a social person. I want you to know that right now. I was not a social person. When I grew up in high school, I was not a social person. I went home, I was a social person. At high school, I kept quiet. Didn't talk to anybody. When I went to college, I saw different people, and I yearned to be part of the various groups that I saw. But I realized that I did not have enough courage to go talk to them or be part of their group. But it was so amazing. When I began to fall in love with Jesus, he began to take me out of my shell. And soon I began to reach out to people and talk to people. I remember when I uh, started passing out literature, I was so freaked out at it. Went through a drive through pharmacy. And I thought, okay, I'm going to pass out a literature to her. I'm going to give her something. And you know, when you think about it so much, it becomes so intense. Pulled into the drive through and the lady said, okay, so the cost is some, something, you know, so amount. And then she says, and, um, you know, here's your medicine. And my, at that moment, it was like everything was in slow motion. And I could hear my heartbeat. That's an irregular heartbeat, right? And I was hearing, and I was like, here's some literature for you. I didn't even look at her. I gave it to her, and then I put the pedal to the metal, and I got out of there as fast as I could. I mean, I was afraid. I was so afraid. I couldn't even look her in the eye because I thought, what if she rejects me when I... by you. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, there it is. Okay, this one? Yeah. Okay, very good. No, it's no. not on. <laughs> okay. And so, those who are disagreeing with you oftentimes are those who are most convicted. I mean, I have been in some circumstances where I thought to myself, man, this person is utterly rejecting what I'm saying to them, but I realize I'm going to still reach out to them. Friends, God calls us to love the unlovable. Amen? And so the great thing about salt is, is that whenever salt is added to a food, it starts tasting better. So whatever situation you might find yourself to be, start being an agent of life. Amen? Start encouraging people. I mean, I thought to myself, I've never had jury duty, but I thought to myself, if I ever had jury duty... I am going to be the most possible, positive jurist in the entire world, even if we convict a person. But I realized something, friends, is as Jesus was in the world, so I am to be in the world. So how do we practically do it? Notice what the Bible says right here, Colossians 4, verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards those who are what? Outside, outside the faith. Redeeming the time. Let your speech always be what? With grace. Now notice these key words seasoned with what? Salt, that you may know how to, how you may ought to answer each one. The Bible tells us that we are not to fight fire with fire. That we are to be a blessing to the entire world. And when we speak, regardless of the circumstance, friends, the Bible teaches us that God will bless. Thank you very much. All right. Very good. Thank you. And then I want you to pay attention to what Jesus says next. He says these words, Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the what? Light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a lampstand and it gives light to where? Everyone in the house. Everyone where? In the house. Notice what Ellen White says right here. Christ does not bid his followers strive to shine. He said, let your light shine. If you have received the grace of God, the light is in you. 
Remove the obstructions and God, the Lord's glory will be revealed. The light will shine forth to penetrate and dispel the darkness. You cannot help shining within the range of your influence. Your prayer should be every day, Lord, remove those things that would prevent the light from shining. And when the light shines, friends, you will see God do incredible things. You know, I'm somebody who used to be a youth pastor. And I never forgot, many times parents would come into my office and they said, Pastor, my son is the son of a devil. And I always thought, do you know what that means you are? <laughs> okay. And they would say things like that. They would say, he is just gone. He's possessed by the devil. He just, I mean, his whole life, he's rebellious, doesn't want anything to do with church. I said, okay. And so what was so amazing, we take these same kids and we would take them like on our teen Bible Academy program where we do one week out in the wilderness. We do a week of study and then we do a week of service and we saw the most incredible changes take place. Now, why am I saying that? When Jesus says you are the light of the world, what he is saying is you are called to be good environment to people. And when you are good environment, do you know what happens? Things grow. I had a garden one time that had this plant that would not grow. The soil was just toxic. It was just so bad. It was depleted of nutrients. I took that same plant and I put it in a better environment and where it had sun and where the soil was good and where it was being watered. And that plant began to grow in the most great, in the, you know, such amazing ways. What am I saying to you? When people are put in different environments, you will see growth happen. And so when Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world, what he is saying is, you are called to be good environment. By the way, when you study out the book of Acts, God grows the church by inserting new ingredients. The church grows every time God inserts a new ingredient. The Holy Spirit fell, the Bible says the church grew. The Bible tells us then, uh, the, the believers begin to use their gifts. The church grew. And then it begins to say, that, you know, there was a need for the... Um, uh, church organization, so they had deacons being arranged. And then what happened, it says the church grew. But there was one ingredient in the book of Acts that contributes to its growth. There was a man by the name of Barnabas, and Barnabas means the son of encouragement. It tells us that when he started being part of the church, the church grew. Here is a man who began to encourage people in the Lord. One man because he saw with the eyes of Christ, no matter how bad things were. You know, in our world today, much of conversation consists of joking, foolishness, nonsense. We've almost disconnected ourselves from having genuine conversations with people. This is the way of the world. But the Bible is teaching us that God wants our light to shine. I had this time, I, did a, I, was, I was speaking at a camp meeting, I did this baptism. These kids came forward. At the very end, they said, hey, we want to talk to our uncle who's a pastor. I said, okay. So we all went for a walk to the other side of camp meeting where their uncle, who was a former pastor, was at. And let me tell you something. They sat down, and this brother just sat down with them, older fellow, just like this. And he says, oh, you want to be baptized? That's incredible. You can't have a better decision than that. And they were just excited. And then he says this incredible story. He says, you're going to deal with struggles in life, but stay faithful to the Lord. And I was sitting there and I was like, man, I wish I had this guy growing up, you know. And this older man, there wasn't bitterness coming out of his mouth. He was paying attention to these young people and he was encouraging them. And then he gave this incredible, inspirational story. He says, back in the day, there was this boxer by the name of Rocky Marciano. You ever heard of him? Powerful boxer. We're not talking about the movie star, right? Rocky Marciano, he took on this guy who people said could not be beat. They went 12 rounds. At the very end of it, Rocky Marciano knocked him out. And all the photographers and the journalists, they interviewed Rocky Marciano. They said, how'd you do it? How'd you beat this guy who people said could not be beaten? And he replied with his face that was bruised up. He looked the people right in the eye and he said these words. I fought one more round. And when he said that, I was like, 
That's incredible. I want to be rebaptized myself. <laughs> but I realized something. He was telling these young people, don't give up. Keep fighting one more round, even when you're knocked down. He was a light in this world. Can you say amen to that? And people were drawn to this light. And when they were in his presence, they felt closer to Christ. Friends, that needs to be the experience more of God's people. We need to be seen and we need not to be seen. God wants us to be a blessing, to reveal the love in a multitude of ways to the world. And friends, when that begins to happen, we will see people drawn to these truths. We will see people drawn to these messages, and Christ will be glorified. Jesus said, you are light in the world, right? By the way, anybody know what this is? This is only one of the, one of the only man-made lights seen from outer space. It's Las Vegas. Sin City. A place I know none of you guys would ever, ever visit or ever been to. Some of you turning to your wife right now, cancel the tickets, right? But think about this, friends. Here you have a city that's known for, you know, sinful practices, you know, doing things in the secret. The point I'm trying to bring is this, that if this city of the world can be seen How much more should God's people be seen in the world? Can you say amen to that? I mean, this is what God wants. He wants our light to shine in our world. By the way, going back to salt, do you want to know when salt is the worst? Salt is the worst when you're sprinkling on your food. You ever do this and it disappears? You're like, okay, I sprinkled enough. But then you bite into the food, you love it. The third or fourth bite, you bite into the food, and you realize some of the salt has clumped up. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you bite into it and you just feel this gross taste. And you're like, oh, that's too much salt in one area. Friends, in the church, when God's people clump up and they don't reach out to other people, guess what? You don't taste good anymore. The church doesn't taste good anymore. Salt is to be spread out. If you have a group or a ministry and you're not inviting others to be part of this, you're not reaching out to those around you, guess what? You are an unhealthy ministry. I've been a pastor for seven and a half years. I have seen healthy ministries and I've seen unhealthy ministries. And the unhealthy ones are like, we have our own group, you're not invited. But ones that are constantly reaching out, seeking to bless the world, Those continue to grow and are blessed by God. Amen? So don't clump the salt up in one area. It needs to be spread out. Amen? Needs to be spread out. You know, it's interesting. There was this theologian. He said these amazing words right here. He said, the glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. It is then that the world is made to listen to her message, though it may hate it at first. Friends, if the world is heading in this direction, and all we're doing is just offering them the world, guess what? They're not going to be attracted to anything else. The world should not be used to try to win the world, right? And it's not so much, okay, what's the church doing? Is it bringing in worldness? What's more important, friends, is the emphasis in an individual's life is a worldliness in your life. Because when there's worldliness in your life, guess what? All you have is the world to attract people. Friends, God wants to use the light that he has given to you to attract others. Amen? To attract others. When it comes to reaching out, we need to make sure that we continue on this step or this progress of the Christian journey, removing things. And friends, if you hate the things that you do and you still find yourself struggling with it, that's a good sign. You want to know why? Because you don't hate your sin unless the Spirit of God puts that hatred in you. So when you begin to feel this enmity against the things that you find yourself struggling to do, that's actually a good sign. That's a positive sign. But you need to continue in that direction. And you need to start praying, Lord, help me to despise my sin even more because I don't want anything to do with it. 
And as you continue on this path of sanctification, you will see God grow you in incredible ways. Amen? He says you are to be salt and you are to be what? Light. You are to be salt and you are to be light in this world. This is what God calls each and every person to be. You may find yourself with a family that doesn't love Christ. You may find yourself in a situation where you're surrounded by people who don't like the things that you believe in. A work environment where you feel pressure, temptations. God is calling you to be salt and light to this world. Not to be infected by the world, but to affect the world for the glory of God. And when you become an encouragement, and when you show people who Jesus, the Lamb of God, is, the most incredible things will begin to take place. Amen? This is what God calls every believer to be, both salt and light. Both salt and light. Let your words be seasoned with salt. Let your actions be light in a dark world.